So today we will have the last lecture and uh, we will see a bit today how all of this mathematics that we've seen in the last two days mostly connects back to physics. And before we do that, let's um, first maybe recap what is this mathematics. So let's let me share the screen. So, so let's quickly recap what we've seen throughout the week. So we started off by looking at these IBP relations, which give you recursions, which you can solve to get a basis of integrals that you need to compute, which are called master integrals. Then the second point was, well, how can you compute these master integrals, the basis? And there we said, well, you can look at differential equations for the master integrals. Say I have a vector of master integrals, then in general, I would end up with a differential equation. It looks like this, where A is a matrix. And in some sense, the main result was, well, that conjecturally, I can define another basis where M is a matrix of algebraic functions. Such that J now satisfies the differential equation of this type. And we said that often A1 is actually zero. And we showed that this leads to the idea that you solve the integrals in terms of iterated integrals. And then the last point, which we then discussed is, okay, what are the simplest iterated integrals you can imagine? And we said that those are polylogs and PLs, multiple polylogs. Uh, I'm just going to write down the definition here. We will see it anyhow in a few slides again. And we looked at their properties. We looked at, uh, we said that there's a Hopf algebra structure, it's a co product, and we use that just to study these functions, to play with them, to massage expressions something that is often called functional relations. So just massaging these expressions that you get for the polylogs and that's for the primary integral. So that's kind of the executive summary of the topics that we have covered. And so now today we'll see how this connects back to uh, amplitudes. And before doing that, there's one topic which I touched upon yesterday at the very end of the lecture, which is this idea of uh, symbols. So remember that the co product allows you to decompose an object into simpler objects. So, like a weight two object, you can decompose into a pair of weight one objects. Weight, so weight two, you could decompose into a pair of weight one. Weight three, you decompose, can decompose into a pair of weight two and weight one, or in the pair of weight one and weight two. And then if you decompose the weight two further, you get a triplet of weight one objects. And remember, due to co-associativity, all ways of iterating it will always give you the same answer. So this one, this triplet of weight one objects is uniquely defined independently of how you got it. You have weight four, then it could be it pairs weight three, weight one, weight two, weight two, weight one, weight three. And then you can iterate into triplets. Two, one, 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 two, one, 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 two. And then you can iterate the way two objects and decompose them into weight one objects. Again, by co-associativity, there's unique way, well, unique answer you can get. And so you see that 
if you maximally iterate this decomposition, you always end up with like a weight n object will be maximally decomposed into an n tuple of weight one objects. Weight one objects are logs. So we decompose a weight n polylog into a sequence of n logarithms. And that quantity is called the symbol. It's kind of an invariant that you can attach to your function. So for example, the symbol of the log is just the log because the way one object is the log you attach to it, the string of logs you attach to this function itself. The symbol of the dialogue, if you look at the formula that we had yesterday, is minus log one minus x tensor log x. And you can iterate this for the n and you get the formula that's shown here. And we also mentioned yesterday briefly that, well, since in any case, these weight one objects are just logs, uh, you may just as well not write the log symbol. So it's just more economical. Instead of um, log x, you write just x in terms of log one minus x, log x, you know, just write one minus x, x, and so on. It's just a notation that people use when they talk about symbols. Okay, is that idea of symbol clear? It's just you decompose an object as much as you can. Uh, just let me mention some properties which all come from what we know already. For example, if you remember that these things are all just, you, you drop the log symbol, then of course, if you have A times B somewhere, that should actually be log A times B, but log A times B is log A times log B. So this leads to this weird looking formula that if you have a product somewhere inside, you can just take it apart with a plus. It's just a consequence of log A times B being log A plus log B. It looks a bit weird because the log sign was dropped. Similarly, whenever you have a one in there, well, log one is zero, so you just drop it. You even drop log minus one, because remember that we generally, there was this pi at the special row, and we often drop it. So those are just consequences of what we know already. Another thing which is important with symbols is, for example, all things like zeta values just vanish. So you lose a lot of information. Why is that? Well, we, we showed yesterday that the co-product of the zeta value of zeta n is this. You see that there's just no way you can decompose this quantity further. So the symbol will be zero. There's no, non, no way you can split it into things that are just objects of weight one. So that's why people, you may have heard people say that the symbol loses a lot of information. That's the reason for it. Let's not go there. The other obvious thing is that if you, for example, I tell you that the symbol of a function is this, remember that we also said yesterday, or maybe let's recall that, that what is when you look at the coaction delta of something, it would have in general two factors. And we said that the first factor is related to discontinuities and the second factor is related to derivatives. And that is where the derivative act, derivatives act. If I tell you that the function has a certain symbol, like shown here, the same statement is all true because the symbol is just derived from the, the co-action, the co-product. So for example, if you want to compute the symbol of a discontinuity of a function, it's very easy in terms with symbols. You take the symbol, you clip off a one, you clip off the first entry, and you multiply by the discontinuity that you would have gotten from log a one. Again, you now you replace again a one. You remember that it's actually a one means logarithm of a one, which has discontinuity. Similarly, if you want to compute a derivative of a guy. You clip off the last one because derivatives always act in the last entry or the second. Second, if you just have two entries, first entry means the leftmost, second entry means the last, the rightmost. So if you differentiate, you clip off the last guy, 
when you multiply by the derivative of the last cap. So the derivatives and discontinuities for symbols are very easy. I'm just pointing this out because this leads to the following thing, which we will encounter when we talk about amplitudes. So imagine you have a function f n. When you compute the derivative, the derivative takes the form of some other function multiplied by d log of some function, which let's say it's a rational function, an algebraic function. If you apply this formula for the derivative in reverse, you see that if derivatives, if I have a function where I have, well, the derivative of a log times a symbol, I can reconstruct the symbol that I started from. So by knowing that a function has a derivative, which only involves d logs of some quantities, I can actually reconstruct the symbol. So therefore the symbol of the full function must be the symbol of, well, the things that appear in the differential equation and this d log. But again, I forget all the log signs. So I can, from differential equations, I can reconstruct the symbol. A function that satisfies such a differential equation is called pure function. And this will be important for amplitudes. We'll see that in a second. So pure functions are functions whose derivatives involve d logs. But what are such functions? Well, for example, take the dialog. The dialog, you know, has this integral representation. So if you compute its derivative, well, it's easy. The derivative is just the integrand. But here dx over x is the same as d log x. So the dialog satisfies the differential equation like the one we said above, d n, so d, d2 here would be fn, equals log one minus x, that is that guy here, times d log of partial function. So what is the symbol of d2? Well, we just can now append d log x becomes x times the symbol of log one minus x, which is one minus x. In particular, this also shows that the dialog would be such a pure function. In general, all polylogs are pure functions. It's very easy to see simply because when you look at the integral definition, it has precisely this recursive structure that you have the same function in the integral, same class of function integral again, which is what you have uh, here. And also in the integral, there is this, well, this integration kernel, which is by construction such a d-log. So you can clearly see that the branch equation of any polylog will be of that type. Fact, it's actually shown here. Okay. So polylogs are these pure functions, ah, wow, representatives of these things called pure functions. Are there any questions at this point? So what does this to do with what we said before? Well, remember that if I, if, you, if I give you a differential equation, there's conjecturally always such a rotation I can do. I can define a new basis J such that J satisfies this differential in canonical form and often A1 is zero. Now, a stronger version of the conjecture, some people may even say that is the conjecture, is that if you're in that case where A1 is zero, so far, I've not told you what A2 is. I just said A2 is left over. But actually, it turns out that A2 has this very special form, which is shown here, 
namely that it's actually just made out of these d logs of algebraic functions. So there's the B's, are, my A2 remember is the matrix. So there's some constant matrices. And the only functional dependence is in such D logs. So for example, when you remember what the differential equation for the massless box was, there was this A2 was had this form here. So there were these two matrices A1 and A2, and then there were denominators, which were one over X and one over one plus X. But one over X is D log X, one over one plus X is D log one plus X. So this, the masses box, we had an example of something where the matrix had this form. We didn't, I didn't tell you at this point because we didn't know yet about polylogs or pure functions, but you expect that, well, you see here that actually the conjecture for what this matrix of differential equations is, is even stronger. It should always have this, if A1 is zero, well, if you can make A1 zero by some algebraic transformation, some algebraic rotation, we expect that the matrix, all functional dependence of the matrix is in D logs. So what does this imply for the solution? Well, remember that we work in dimensional organization. So we want to expand things in epsilon. So J, we want to expand it in epsilon. But since the differential equation has this special form, the coefficients will now always be these pure functions of weight k. So the coefficient of epsilon to the k will be a pure function of weight k. So it's a very constrained thing. We'll look at the master's box in a second. You will see it there. Now, we said that all polylogs are these pure functions. So a polylog of weight k would be a pure function of weight k. Now, you can, of course, turn the question around and say, does it mean that whenever I, in that scenario, do I get polylogs? And the answer is usually yes, in general, no. What I mean by that is that in all examples we know in physics, whenever we have this form of D logs, people manage to bring it to polylogs. However, you can show mathematically that there are, are things that would be pure functions in that sense, but you cannot write them in terms of polylogs. And I want to highlight that because this has led to a lot of confusion in the physics literature because all of a sudden there was a folklore conjecture that said, as soon as you get this canonical form, you will be able to write your answer in terms of polylogs. And this has led to very strong claims about certain certain quantum field theories, but they, those claims are unfounded. Just because you have D log integrands does not mean you get polylogs. That is what was promoted by some people that D log integrands means that you have polylogs. It's not true. Good. Just to show you this on the example of the massless box that we looked at, let me. This. So this is the Mathematica notebook that we had looked at the other day where we computed the master's box. This is the end of that notebook. And I show you here two things. So there were, there was this matrix M, which was this matrix for which we had to rotate the system in order to get to this canonical form. I can show you also the canonical form. So this is the matrix A2. And you see that, well, as expected, a bit more transparent. This matrix has this form of A0 dx over x plus A1 dx over 1 plus x. So that is precisely such a matrix of d log form because dx over x is d log x, dx over 1 plus x is d log one plus x. So it's a matrix of d log forms as we, as we said. 
And so then we had gone on and we had solved the system in terms of a path ordered exponential. And you see here, for example, at weight one, where at order epsilon one, you just see logs in the matrix, which are poly logs of weight one. If you look at the path ordered exponential at order epsilon square, you see here log square, which has weight two. Here down here in this term, you say dialog, which has weight two log square x, which has weight two, log square one plus x, which has weight two, log a product of two logs, which has weight two. And you can check all the entries in the matrix that belong with weight two. So all, every entry in this matrix has weight two. If you go to order epsilon cube, the path ordered exponential would have uh, now at order epsilon cube has a log cube, it has things like dialogs times logs, trilogs. So all the terms have weight three. And if you look at the solution for the box, so then we have fixed initial condition. And if you look at the solution for the box, this is for J. So after rotation, it has one, which has weight zero, epsilon times log X, which has weight one, epsilon squared times log squared and pi squared, which all have weight two. This is not a, the second line is not a mass set. This was, the box itself, the first line, this, the next two are the bubble master integrals. As all the epsilon zero, it has one. And then there's no epsilon. And then the term proportional to uh, the coefficient of epsilon square is pi square. And the other bubble would have a constant weight zero, epsilon times the log, which has weight one, epsilon square times pi square. And if you rotate back by the matrix M to get actual master integrals, including all the poles in epsilon. Then, of course, now this is a bit different. Now you have a pole in epsilon, you have a constant and log X. So that's not true. But this basis J, which I got from rotating away this matrix, has this internal structure that all the terms are pure functions of weight K if you look at the coefficient of epsilon K. Okay. Are there questions? No, good. Then let's go back to the to the lecture itself. And that's all I want to say about the differential equations and the polylog. So let's go back to our meetings. So um, to start, well, let me make an assumption. Namely, let me assume that I give you an L loop amplitude and that I can actually express it in terms of polylogs because otherwise, I don't know. The only class of functions that are really well understood are polylogs. There are more other classes of functions that we start to understand now, but really concrete statements we can make when we have polylogs, which are already, which already a lot, and you can do many things with those. So let's say you have such an amplitude which you can evaluate in terms of polylogs. So is there anything you can say? I have a question. Yeah. Are counterexamples known? Counterexamples of- uh, loop Amplitudes which cannot be expressed in MPLs. Yep, and it's a very easy one. Well, Easy, I mean, it's easy to find the counterexample. It's not easy to, to evaluate it. Um, this one, where you make all the proper vectors massive, the mass non zero. Um, this was done, I think, already, even in the 50s already, this was known not to be polylogs. It's actually an elliptic integral. Well, the cut is an elliptic integral. Yeah. It took until. 2015, before people were actually able to evaluate the two loop bubble with massive propagators. Because it's on the polylog. Thank you. And the mathematics itself goes back to 2010. That is also the reason why before that no one was able to, to do it because the mathematics itself just didn't exist until 10 years ago. 
But does that mean it's not a pure function or it is, but uh, it's in a different class? That's a very interesting question. And uh, that is one of the things that people are looking at right now. What does that mean, pure function in that context? That would mean, would require a lot of, like you would need everything I told you so far, you would need to lift it at a higher abstract mathematical level. And you would realize that there is a generalization, at least for these objects, or these notions of pure functions. And um, that's actually what, what happens is that this mathematical literature, sorry, this mathematical literature for 2010, what it introduced is something called elliptic polylogs. So there's a variant of polylogs, which are generalized. So you have, on the one hand, elliptic integrals, which are mathematics of the 19th century. You have polylogs, but you have another class of function which kind of contains both. And that is what you need for this uh, two loop bubble. And if you go to that class, then all of a sudden you see that also these concepts like uniform transcendentality or uniform weight. Uh, when you weight means that the weight of the function is connected to the order in epsilon, that all of these things generalize, but it becomes mathematically more challenging, but there is a generalization. How deep that goes, that is currently still to be understood, but there is clearly something. Okay, good. So, but let's go back to these things that we know are polylogs because there we know what we're doing. All the others are this, like at the front of research, as you've seen, these things go back to 2015. So, the first thing is that if you take an L loop amplitude in four space times dimen four space time dimensions, the weight that you can get is bounded by. 2L. So if you have L loops in four space and dimensions, the weight is 2L. You can be a bit sharper and you could say, well, if you look at it as um, you have an integral, which is given in dimensional realization by an expansion in epsilon, and you work in these space time dimensions, you would expect that the weight of IK in D dimensions is bounded by uh, it's actually to be D divided by two times L plus K. So there's a bound, which means that, so there's a general bound, which depends on the space time dimension, the number of loops and the order at which you work in dimensional organization. And you see that if you put D equal to four, and you say, well, K is equal to zero because I work at L loops, so I throw away all the higher order terms dimensionalization, you see that the weight must be bounded by two times the loop number. So that's already quite something. And that is holds for all examples we know, which is thousands of examples. That's already quite something. So somehow the weight tells us there's only a certain weight that can appear in your amplitude and it's connected to the perturbative expansion. So what else can we say? Um, so imagine I give you such an amplitude and I act on it with my coercion and I get two factors, the left factor and the right factor. We also said that discontinuities only are only encoded in the left factor. Correct. But the discontinuities of an amplitude are encoded in unitarity. So actually you see that the the co-product co-action encodes unitarity because it, it knows in its left fact that it's continuities. So the left factors in the co-action of an amplitude 
are very constrained by uh, unitarity. So the left factors must always be such that you you're consistent with unitarity, which is a very strong constraint on what the left factors can be. This is something that people are looking at right now. It's called, well, sometimes called the cosmic Galois principle. It's a very fancy word, but there's a whole mathematical theory behind what this means. The first entries are constrained. There's it's a very deep mathematical property, which we cannot go into, which is encoded into this correction. I have a question I meant to ask earlier, mm -hmm. but it's a question about anomalous thresholds. Yeah. Um, are they determined by unitarity as well? Um, well, no. So here I'm really looking at um, the thresholds that I would say get on the on the physical sheet. I would not I mean normally thresholds just to get the language right for me are these would be like, for example, you take the three point function where you have a threshold, which is not on the, on the physical sheet, right? Is that what you are? Right. Mm -hmm. exactly. So here I'm talking just about the physical thresholds, not those that I get by first continuing to another sheet and then looking at the discontinuities there. Those exist and they are, if you want, well, they are, well, okay. So what I constrain here are the normal thresholds. Okay. The first is continuities. There is something which I'm not discussing here, which you may have heard of at some point. So there's actually, well, yeah, maybe, maybe let's look at it with the following way. So let's look at the symbol. The symbol would mean if I take the amplitude now, I would not just have two factors, but I would have many. I would have up to, well, 2L, because I said the weight is bounded by 2L. Now, if you look at it in this simple way, where it's completely unfolded, if you like, then what I was discussing here was unitarity. That is A1. A1 is constrained by unitarity. It should just have discontinuities where unitarity tells me there's a threshold. Now, what is we said at the beginning of the lecture, this is the same as clipping off the first entry and multiplying by the discontinuity of this guy. So that is this factor here encodes the threshold. But you see, after I've done that, the first entry has become A2. So A2 will know about the discontinuity of the discontinuity. A3 will know about the discontinuity of the discontinuity of the discontinuity. And it's in this way that all of these things are encoded. It's in, in, this, in this symbol, in this string of things. And then all of a sudden you see that going from left to right means that you go deeper and deeper and deeper. You go to more and more higher Riemann sheets. For example, something that people look at, like Lance Dixon, they look at A2, there's something called Steinman relations, which goes back to uh, Steinman in the 60s, like algebraic quantum field theory that gives you constraints on um, double discontinuities of the type you should not have this well. You, should, you shouldn't be in a situation where you have so quantum field theory forbids you this double discontinuities of this type because there's no physical space-time picture attached to it where particles can be on shell. So A2 would, for example, know about Steinman, which is then also related to this kind of anomalous thresholds where you have discontinuities associated to going to other Riemann sheets. So that would be what is contained in this unfolding into more and more building blocks. Okay. Okay, thanks. Good. So the core product of the amplitude knows something about physics. It knows about, for example, about unitarity. That's one of the things that I think we should say. Now, if I just stay on general grounds, I think this is pretty much all I can say. So this is already very useful and can help you a lot. 
because, uh, for example, it gives you, for example, a way to study discontinuities of amplitudes. You can do it via the code product, for example. And there's a whole mathematical background behind it, as I said, we're not going there. Instead, what I will focus on for the rest of the lecture is the following. If I now turn on the dynamics of the theory, it turns out that in some special theories, the world becomes really nice. And all of a sudden, um, this weight almost gets a physical meaning. In particular, there are some theories, particularly it's this theory called N equals for super animals. We'll define this theory in a second, where all of a sudden, an L loop amplitude has weight 2L. So it's no longer just bound, it becomes a strict thing that in certain special quantum field theories, the quantum field theory really knows about the weight and only certain functions that have a certain weight are allowed to show up. And it's very weird. It's not really understood why that happens. It's maybe has that even to do with like in the ability of the theory that there's some deeper mathematical structure underlying it that tells you that these things that we have defined from essentially pure mathematics, number theory, this, this weight and this polylogs, all of a sudden is reflected in the analytic structure of the quantum field theory itself. So yeah, let's maybe skip this the second comment for a second. And let's, before we continue, let's maybe define what is this special theory and it goes for super animals because I guess that not everybody is familiar with it. So what is n equals for super animals? So let's let's take it apart. Let's take this um, this word apart. So let's start from young mills. That, that's one of the words in there. I guess you're all familiar with young mills. Young mills, the young mills theory is this plus k chicks. So it's the theory of gluons. And then dynamics is the three gluon vertex and the four gluon vertex. And well, it's the theory of gluons in four space and dimensions. Um, so the gluon field has four components, but you know very well that due to gauge symmetry, two of those are redundant and there are only two degrees of freedom, two bosonic ones, which is the positive velocity gluon and the negative velocity gluon. Those are the only two physical degrees of freedom that I have in, in the gluon field in four, in four space and dimensions. Okay, this is something I guess you know, this QCD if you want. So now let's make it super, super symmetry. Again, probably this is something you've heard, so let me just be brief. So what is super symmetry? Well, it's, it's a symmetry and it has charges called supercharges. Let's say if I charge Q and if it's emission conjugate, and those Q and the summation conjugate, they will anti-commute. So if you're not familiar with the notation, this means Q, Q dagger plus Q dagger Q. And this charge is such that if you act on a state of spin S, you get a state of spin uh, one half higher, and if you act with Q, you get the state of spin one half less. That's all you need to know for, for this lecture. Okay, so it's a Q itself, if you want, has spin one half. So if it acts on a certain a, a state with a certain spin, it changes the spin by one half, so it changes both into fermions and fermions into bosons. So you can do this, for example, for young mills, you get super young mills. And so we said young mills has two bosonic degrees of freedom, the positive velocity gluon, the negative velocity gluon. Now, if I act with my super generators, I get two fermionic degrees of freedom, the positive velocity gluon and the negative velocity, uh, sorry, the positive velocity gluino and the negative velocity gluino. Uh, for the experts, I'm talking on shell supersymmetry here. I'm not, let's do not discuss the, what happens if I go off shell because everything I want to do is on shell. 
Now, this is something called n equals one supersymmetry. Why n equals one? Because I have one supercharge, which means that for every for the for the positive velocity gluon, there's a positive velocity gluino and only one, because I had one supercharge that allows me to change the gluon into a gluino. Of course, I could have more supercharges. So I could imagine something where I have, for example, four supercharges, and I label them now with an index A on the cube. These supercharges will still all enter commute. But F4 of them now. And so what happens if I look, now look at the spectrum of the theory? Well, it should be a supersymmetric extension of Young Mills. So there's a gluon which has spin plus positive velocity gluon, there's spin plus one. And so what are the other states of the theory? Well, I should be able to get them. If it's a multiplet, I should be able to get them by acting with generators. The first thing is that what you can notice if I act with a Q dagger, which raises the spin, I want to get zero. I kind of postulate I get zero. Why? Because I want young Mills theory. I want to have, no, I do not want to have higher spin particles in there. So the gluon should be a high spin state. So if I try to raise the spin, I must get zero. It's like the highest weight state. Now let's lower the spins. Let's go down. Let's see what the spectrum is. Well, if I act with one of my generators QA, each of them will change spin one into spin one half. Well, have velocity plus one into velocity plus one half. And I have two different ways of doing that, depending on my index A. So I get four gluinos, not just one. And each of them is spin plus one half. Okay, well, if I lower, if I act with more Qs, so I lower the spins even further, I have now spin plus one half, I get now it's been zero. And note that, well, I had four indices here on the Q, and I have also four gluinos. But of course, they are related to the Qs always. And the Qs enter commute. So I had, on the original formula, I had four here, four here. So it looks like I have 16. But actually, it's only. It's anti-symmetric in A and B. And an anti-symmetric 4 by 4 matrix has four degrees of freedom. So I only have uh, six scalars. So I have six scalar degrees of freedom. I can lower it further. Well, now I have this uh, state here. Remember, this is anti-symmetric. And I have the Q which gives me now, if I lower spin zero by half the unit, I get spin minus a half. So I get a negative velocity gluino, which is totally anti-symmetric in ABC. So I may just as well say, well, it is a Levi Civita with four indices compacted with some other D. So that is where you see the four come from. So it's totally anti-symmetric in three indices. So equivalently epsilon ABCD times uh, vector with four components. So I have four gluinos with velocity minus a half. And I can go even further. So if I act with another Q, I get something that is, has these four guys, but it's totally anti-symmetric. So it's just portion to Levi Civita times a number, which is now, well, the state of spin or velocity minus a half, minus one, which is the negative velocity glue. So in this way, I can construct the whole multiplet and actually note that if I now would, would try to lower it even further, I would get zero simply because I had only four Qs and this would be the fifth time that I act. And since the Qs and I commute, note that, well, note that QA, QB equals zero implies QA squared is zero. So I have if I act five times and I only have four objects and this totally and they all enter commute, I must find zero. So I've constructed the whole multiplet, which is shown here. It's the on shell spectrum of equals for super and mills. I have 
a gluon of positive velocity, gluon of negative velocity. I have four gluinos with velocity plus minus a half. And if you count, then if you do the counting, then so far I would have had like two gluon states, eight gluino states, but I have six more scalars. And so I have both eight bosonic and eight fermionic degrees of freedom. Another comment which I can make is that uh, this is what is sometimes called maximal supersymmetry. The reason is that you could say, well, could I do this? Could I play the same game starting with like n equals five? And you would see that it wouldn't work because if I require that there's no spin greater than one, and you go down, you can do all of this. But of course, now I wouldn't find zero anymore at the fifth stage because I would have a fifth generator. So I would generate something which would have a spin greater than one, which is not what I want in a young Earth theory. So four supercharges is the maximum you can have in four space time dimensions if you want to have a super symmetric version of young Earth. Okay. So I think this is a good time to take a break. And during the break, you can already start thinking about the question. When n equals of is actually not realized in nature, as we know, so why do we care? And after the break, I will show you why it is a nice theory and why many people care about this theory. Okay, so let's take a short break and uh, you can also take the opportunity to ask questions if you like. So let's go back to um, n equals four super young mills. And as I said, it's actually not realized in nature. So it's not something that you would uh, find as well. It's not a theory that you study because you want to make predictions, say, for collider experiments. But as we will see, it's a theory that is very clean mathematically. So you can use it to study quantum field theory and its properties. So what do we know about it? So the first thing we know is that it's actually it's a conformal field theory. It's uh, super conformal even because it's super symmetric and conformal. So it's a conformal field theory. So it has more symmetries than say QCD or the standard model. And it develops even more symmetries if you go to what is called the planar limit. So the planar limit, if you don't know what it is, it is roughly speaking, take QCD, it's the number of the gauge group is SUN, and you make N very large in a specific way. So you make N very large, you have many, many colors in a specific way, such that G squared, G is the young Mills coupling times N is fixed. So the coupling goes to zero, the number of colors becomes very large so in such a way that G squared times N is fixed. That's a limit you can take mathematically. What you can prove is that in terms of Feynman diagrams, this means that only planar diagrams contribute. I, for those of you who don't know what planar diagrams are, planar means, for example, this graph is planar. It means that I can draw the, the graph without crossing lines. While something like this would not be planar. Because you see here, this, if I want this the particle here, which is an external particle, which comes from the outside, I need to cross some other line. So this graph is not planar. And you can show that in this limit where you make the number of colors very large and the gauge coupling very small, it, this graph would not contribute while this graph contributes. It looks a bit like artificial, but many interesting things happen in gauge theories in general and in equals of super young mills in particular if you go to this limit. Particular n equals for super young mills develops more symmetries even. So it is super symmetric, it is conformal. And if you go to the planar limit, you even get more symmetries. In fact, you get an infinite dimensional symmetry group. So if you think of it classically, um, for every generator of your symmetry, you have a conserved charge. 
So if you have an infinite dimensional, infinite number of conserved charges, you can fix infinitely many degrees of freedom, which means that you would essentially have an integral field theory in the classical sense. So that is why people actually believe that the super young mills is integrable. So it should be in the planar limit. It should be an example of a gauge theory in four dimensions that is integrable, meaning you can solve it exactly. It has infinitely many conserved charges. So what is this additional symmetry is we will see in a few slides. So you see something very special. It's really in principle very far away from QCD. So what about the amplitudes in this theory? Because that's what we care about. Now we will only talk about external gluon states because all others are related to the gluons by supersymmetry transformations. So we just care about the gluons. So what is a gluon state? A gluon state, well, what do, do I need to, to give you in order to describe it? I need to give you three things. I need to give you its momentum, P, which is a light like vector in four dimensions. I need to give you the elicity of the gluon, plus minus one. And I also need to give you the color. So there's also the gluon also carries a color quantum number, which lives in the adjoint representation. So it takes values between one and n square minus one. So I think I had a previous slide that called the number of colors, n, not nc. So in QCD, this would be eight, where you have SU3. You would have three square minus one, so eight different gluons. So that is the information that you have to give a gluon state. So your amplitude, imagine now you have a scattering amplitude for n gluons. Well, for each gluon, you have to give me this triplet of information. Now, what you can show on very general grounds is that in the planar limit, you can factor off the information on the color. So the details of this formula are not so important. So there's a sum over permutations and then a trace of uh, color matrices. The T's are the usual SUN color generators. And then it is multiplied by something which only depends on the elicity and the momentum. It's called the color ordered amplitude. Now, it will depend on only on holistic momentum, but not on color, but it will depend on the order at which the particles appear. Because now we see the coefficient here, this guy, will depend on this permutation. So the color coefficient will depend on the ordering of the gluons. And then there's a kinematic coefficient, which only depends on momentum and helicities which you can also compute from Feynman diagrams, that Feynman holds to compute it, but it will depend on the ordering of the external particles. Why, why SN minus one and not SN? Uh, because you could also write it as SN modulo ZN. It is because the trace is cyclic. Okay, yeah, so thanks. It is uh, permutations, modular cyclic permutations. It's the same as you fix one and you permute the others. It's like residual symmetry of the color factor, if you want. But since we're talking about that, there's actually that cyclicity leaves a trace in the color ordered amplitude. Namely that, yes, the color ordered amplitude depends on the order of the particles but it is all itself cyclic because the color factor is cyclic. And I took here the opportunity to use a notation which is very handy and often used in this context. You just write, so the inform every gluon in the color ordered amplitude is given by its momentum and its helicity, P and H. This is often written in the following way. You just write one to the power plus minus, means gluon with momentum P1 and helicity plus minus. Every H can just be plus or minus one. So that's a notation that is very handy and often used in this context. Then you can show actually that by supersymmetry, if all the gluons have the same helicity, for example, all plus, but it could also be all minus, the amplitude will vanish always. 
and the same if there's only one negative ballistic particle. Uh, to understand where this comes from is actually not so difficult to understand it. Well, you have to go to the proof, but the basic idea is imagine, imagine this object here was non-zero. That means I would have an amplitude of this type where all the external particles are gluons. But now by supersymmetry, that must be the same as if I were to change that into fermions. One of them, for example. But then helicity is conserved along the fermion line. So if, if I, if it is, uh, well, if plus goes in, minus must come out. So that is inconsistent with the fact that I could have gotten this thing from an amplitude where all the blue ones have positive helicity. Okay. It's just to motivate the derivation. It's not important. Okay. Uh, it really comes from supersymmetry. So the only amplitude, the first amplitude that is non-zero is the one where you have uh, exactly two negative ballistic ones, say at position i and j in my cyclic ordering, and the rest is positive. So all the others here have positive ballistics. If two negatives, the rest is positive. And at three level, the first miracle happens so that is an amplitude it may depend on a million gluons and n could be a million and now you can imagine to figure out what is the number of Feynman diagrams that you need to evaluate to compute a million gluon scattering and there will be many many more than millions billions probably still the answer fits into a line the answer is just a single line but not just a single line a single term this, uh, very famous formula called the Park Taylor formula says that actually the amplitude when gluon scattering is a single term, which has these weird angle bracket notations. Which, well, those who know what it is, you know what it is, it's spinner product. Otherwise, you think of it as complex square roots of minus and That's good enough. So it's square roots of minus and variance with the certain phase. For the experts, these are just spinner products. Yeah, products between, um, yeah, spiral spinners or chiral spinners. Okay, so that's the first miracle. That's well, by supersymmetry, the all plus amplitude vanishes, the amplitude with a single minus uh, v1 vanishes, and at three level, uh, the simplest amplitude that you can imagine, the one that has two negative velocities. Is a single term. Now, of course, we want to do loops. Before we do that, let's talk a bit about the bookkeeping. So, the simplest amplitude that we had here with two negative ballistic ones is often called MHV amplitude, maximum velocity violating. So, as we said, it has two negative ballistic ones, and the rest is positive. Little n is the number of gluons and plus and minus is the number of positive and negative. And then you often hear people talk about things like next to MHG amplitude or NMHG amplitudes. That would be the one, well, the next to simplest one. So it has three negative ballistic gluons and the rest is positive. And then it goes on like this. If N, N MHG amplitudes has four negative ballistic gluons and so on, all the way down to, well, the other side where you have now two positive velocity and the rest is negative velocity and that is then often called MHV bar because it's like the same you can flip it over you just exchange the whole of plus and minus so that is what if you hear people talk about MHV amplitudes and MHV amplitudes it's just a name for the bookkeeping of uh, the positive and negative velocity joints good so Now let's imagine you take such an MEG amplitude. So you have two negative ballistic ones and the rest is positive. And by convention, I assume that all my momenta are outgoing, but it's immaterial. So momentum conservation tells me that some of these momenta must be zero. 
So I can also just add them one after the other in the specific ordering that I fixed. Remember that after I stripped off the color information, there was an, an ordering attached to my new ones. And so I can take these momenta in the specific ordering and attach and add them one after the other. And I get a closed polygon because they must sum up to zero. Now, if you have a, a polygon is a closed contour. If you have an engaged to you, you have a closed contour. You can go and evaluate Wilson loop on this contour. And the miracle is that in any planar limit of any equals super young males, if you evaluate an MHV amplitude, or if you evaluate the Wilson loop on the contour formed by the momenta, you get the same thing. Now, the experts may know I'm jumping over some details here, but in first approximation, that's what you can, we can say. So that is something that is only true in this theory. It's, it's essentially duality. It says that Wilson loops and MEG amplitudes in this theory are the same. What? Wilson loops along these polygonal contours and scattering amplitudes is the same thing in this theory, which is uh, quite a re remarkable thing. Now, how can I describe a polygon? Clearly, it's better described by the corners of the polygon, the vertices. And of course, my momenta are now differences of position coordinates. And I said before that N equals for super young mills has, uh, in the planar limit, it has many, many symmetries, infinitely many. The reason is that actually these additional symmetries that you get is that you have now these coordinates X here which are non-local because they come, they are new position coordinates such that their difference is a momentum. So they're not the normal position space. But there's also a conformal symmetry in these X coordinates. So there are two conformal symmetries. One is the normal conformal symmetry that defines any of super as CFT. The other one is some kind of non-local version of it, which only lives in the XI, sometimes called dual conformal symmetry. So there are two copies of it, two, two copies, two completely independent copies of uh, conformal symmetry, of super conformal symmetry even. And now you can start to com uh, compute commutators between like generators of one conformal symmetry and the other conformal symmetry. And that's how you generate this infinite number of conserved charges. For the experts, what you get is you have the conformal symmetry. Then the dual conformal symmetry would be the level one Youngian generators. And the infinite dimensional symmetry is the whole tower of infinite, the infinite tower of Youngian generators. So the infinite dimensional symmetry is actually the Youngian of uh, the conformal symmetry. That's common for the experts. So that shows you already that the super is very special. And it has this very weird properties. Are there questions about N equals for super young mills? This was more like a snapshot just to, to give you an idea of what this theory is. Okay, so why am I telling you this? Well, it turns out that people have realized in the last couple of years that in NX for super animals, essentially, you can often write down the answer, even for an amplitude with at very high numbers of loops without do computing any integral. So usually to do loop computations, you have to compute integrals. It turns out in this theory, you can actually often write down the answer just in closed form without doing any integral. And that is of course a dream because it means that while well, usually doing integrals is very tough, but maybe here you can just bypass it altogether. 
And then hopefully if you understand how that works here, maybe you can also do it in a realistic theory. So you should think of this theory as a theory that is highly symmetric because it has infinite number of conserved charges, but it's really like a theoretical laboratory to study the structure of gauge theories. On the one hand, you have infinitely many conserved charges, should be integrable, so you can really look at, say, even finite coupling. On the other hand, is something that has lots of mathematical structures so that the perturbative expansion is very constrained and you can see what is the mathematical structure of the perturbative expansion. And let's just have a glimpse at how this works. And there this hop algebra and the weight and all these things will be, will be the key. So before we do that, let me just this is more like a technical aside. It's not important directly for the discussion. So the amplitude, the endpoint amplitude in any equals for super young girls in the planar limit is what it is. Usually it would diverge, but it will diverge, it must diverge. There's incorrect divergences. There are no UV divergences because the theory is conformal, but they are. They have massless particles, so there are incorrect divergences. Um, what you want to do is you want to do to have something where you take a ratio such that all the divergences cancel. So you divide by something that I call here ABDS. It doesn't matter what it is. It's some. Yeah. It's essentially the exponential of the one of amplitude. You divide by that, and and then the ratio you can show is finite. Why do you want that? Well because these infrared divergences make all of these conformal symmetries anomalous. While if you take clever ratios to get something that is finite, then things are invariant under symmetry, the anomaly cancels. If you want a bit more tackling explanation, what is this denominator that you divide by? In general, you would have anomalies due to infrared divergences. You can solve the anomaly equation and you divide by that. So you have like a special solution to the anomaly equation and you divide by that, that would be this PDF thing. It's not important. The important thing is that it's more like a technical side. What I call amplitude here is something that is finite and has all the conformal symmetries of the theory. That's all you need to know. The other thing is that it's normalized in such a way that at leading order it is one. That's a normalization choice. And you can also show that you can normalize it in such a way that at one loop, A here is my coupling constant. At one loop, it is zero. So it only starts at two loops. So that is the, the general setup. So those are the things you want to compute. It's more like on the side. You compute things that are zero, well, one at three levels, zero at one loop, and then you have the quantum corrections start at two loops. They are finite and they have all the symmetries on the field. That's those are the things you want to compute. So we said that they are fine, they, they vanish at one loop, as we said already. You can also show that for four and five external particles, actually all the quantum corrections vanish. That is something that is essentially it's a consequence of the symmetry. The symmetry is so strong that um, there's just nothing left. The symmetry fixes the whole thing at four and five points and there's nothing left. So the first thing you want to compute is two loops for six particles. That is the simplest thing. And you also have to specify the elicity. So the simplest thing in any of those Hooper and Mills you can compute is the MHV amplitude for six particles at two loops. And now, the conjecture is that this function, if you take the MHV amplitude, is a pure function in, in the technical sense of the word as we have defined it, of weight 2L. So you see that once you made all the symmetries manifest, all of a sudden, like 
this function is one of these very special functions, these few functions, and the weight is coupled to the loop order, and it goes up if you increase the loop order. So, for example, at so if I look at R for n particles at L loops, you would have that for one loop the function is zero, it doesn't exist. Here's the weight, weight four, weight six, weight eight, weight 10, weight 12. So weight four, I remind you, means something like leave four, or log to the four in these kind of things. So it's very much constrained, but can show up. Why that is, it's not really understood, but somehow, all calculations that we know, and we know by now many, many loops um, for n equals six. Some people have gone all the way to seven loops. For n equals seven, I think by now it's at four or five. I am not sure anymore because things are developing so fast and also the reason I'm saying I'm not sure is because all this depends on what you call having done the calculation as well. Some people compute, for example, the symbols of the answer, not the full. So. Now, for eight, there we're still struggling with two loops. And I will comment on that at the end. So at least what I'm gonna tell you is something that for six and seven particles uh, has essentially allowed big breakthrough. So the reason you go here to seven loops is, well, because at some, so seven loops would be polylogs of weight 14. So it's um, well, just writing down all of these functions is, the expressions become gigabytes quickly. So at some point you just have to stop. But it shows that in principle, you could do it. If you manage to go to seven loops, the probability that you can continue is pretty high. So how have people done that? Well, the idea is the following, something that's now known as the bootstrap program. The idea is that you say, okay, we know that this function should be pure and have a certain weight. So can I use that to essentially write down a unique pure function of a certain weight whose analytic structure is such that, that that is the only thing the amplitude can be. So those of you who know what my, the analytic S matrix program is, this goes a bit in that direction again, and people often refer to that. So that for those of you who know don't know what that is, there was say, well, it was also before my time. Um, there was say in the 60s, before people really started to evaluate Feynman diagrams, people were trying to construct scattering amplitudes essentially from first principles by just saying, well, let's what are the analytic structures of the functions that could be a scattering amplitude and use that to determine. Uh, the amplitudes, then it died away because final diagrams took over and uh, they became the main workforce. But people are going back to this idea of uh, try to write down the unique answer that the amplitude could be. Now, let me sketch you how something like this can work. And I can only sketch it because things get grow very quickly. The complexity of these calculations is enormous. The idea, however, that underlies it, I think is very clear. But the combinatorics that you get if you want to do it grows extremely quickly. So the idea is the following. So, maybe go here. So we said, Let's do uh, n equals six, R six at L loops. So this should be 
pure function. We postulate it's Goldilocks. There's good motivation for that. We, I will comment on that at the end. And it, the weight at L loops should be 2L. Good. Now that means I could also have representative thing in, in as, well, an approximation of this would have been a symbol, which would have been something that we said already, a, a bunch of terms, not just one term, a bunch of terms of this type. There are two L, weight two L means that I can decompose it into a symbol, a string of length two L. And then of course I have, I have many of these, okay, so I would have one i to l and then i would have coefficient multiplying which is a rational map so that that, would, that is a skeleton of what a function such a function is a pure function i can compute it symbol it has this form now so far i've not told you much so i've used now the fact that it's a pure function so it has a symbol it is a polylog and the symbol has a certain length. That's what I've used. So I've used some information already about the structure, I mean, that's pure way too well. The problem is I have not told you much because what are these guys? And what are what is this guy? Now, the basic idea is that the AIs, they live in a set All the AIs at whatever loop order is, if you want this conjecture, there are only nine possible values these AIs could take. Why? Well, originally it came from having done the calculation at two loops and then at three loops, and then you see this what you get, roughly speaking. And then people actually realize that you can motivate this mathematically. There, you would need to go into a whole different direction, but there's a mathematical motivation why this is the right thing to do. So there will only be nine possible values these AIJs could have. So you see, now it's very strong because now if I tell you what is the most general symbol that I can have, well, now all of a sudden the problem has, lives in a finite dimensional space. I can write down all possible objects of this type. I don't know yet what the coefficients are, but I can at least write down what is the most general skeleton, for example. So how can I then determine the CIs? Well, now I use the fact that I know that the symbol and codes, for example, the discontinuities. We said that uh, the symbol of disk, well, let's say well, six L here, would then be related to things where I just compute, I clip off the first, the first guy, and I keep the others. I would now start from A2. So since I know what is, where the discontinuities of the amplitude should be, I know that, well, only certain, so I, at every slot, I have two L slot and then I've, and well, in general I would have nine to the power two L terms. Now you see the combinatorial problem, this thing goes very quickly. But now you see already that the first, the A1 for each of these terms must be very constrained because that is where the branch cuts of the function should be. And actually what you can show is that unitarity tells you that all those that are A1, they can only be in a set of three. Which is so there's a subset of well, it's actually not a subset. There are only three different choices. Let's call it this. There are only three choices. For those, there are three choices. So 
So it already becomes more constrained. There are similar constraints that are more complicated for what can be in second position. There's six actually. And then also for the higher ones, there are certain there are constraints. So you can already write down a much simpler answer. It's not nine to the two L, it's already much smaller. And this is because you know how the symbol encodes unitarity. Then you can even do more. So this is just recaps what I was explaining. Now the symbol, for example, at two loops at all entries known as all only entries, all the entries in the symbol come from a set of nine elements. Could be anything, but they're only nine. So by playing this game in the end, I can now ask myself, construct a space of functions which satisfies all of these constraints. It has a certain weight n, n is two times L. So essentially, right, solve all the constraints from unitarity. Yes, we said that unitarity tells you the first entry must we have the symbol letters. Letters often means these are these. So these guys, the axes here are called the letters. So if I say that construct all the function whose symbols only have entries from this nine letter set and satisfy these additional constraints by unitarity. If I do that, I get the vector space of all functions that would be say compatible with unitarity. And then, well, let's skip over this, this is a bit this is technical, this is material. Yeah, let's skip over this. The, the upshot is that you get a vector space in which the amplitude lives. And so you would get something like, for example, I write it here for two loops, but it could be anything. You have a basis for the vector space in which the amplitude can live. So the basis elements would be um, the BIs. They all have weight to L, they have the correct structure of the symbol to satisfy all constraints that you know from unitarity. So you have like a basis for the space in which the amplitude can live with certain free coefficients ci, which are rational numbers. But so far you've only imposed that these are things that satisfy unitarity. Now you can still put in information on the dynamics. For example, you know what should happen to an amplitude in the collinear limit. There's also some other input that is specific to dynamics and equals for super -animals. So you put in some, you have to get some information from somewhere else. Like what the amplitude does in certain limits, if, for example, at very high energy, in the limit where two particles become very close, in the limit where a particle has a vanishing energy, you know what quantum field theory does there and what n equals four does there. Plus you have input from integrability. So you have some boundary data which you can use to determine the coefficients in the basis of decomposition. So you, you factorize the problem into two. One problem is construct the basis of all possible functions that have the right analytic properties for unitarity. You write down an answer of this type and you try to fit the coefficients so that you match the dynamical information that you have in the quantum field theory. And you do not compute any integral. You really go back to this idea of analytic S matrix and construct the answer as the unique function which has the right properties. Now, I said this, 
has been done at six points. This has been done at seven points. So it's very successful and it, it works. But it works conjecturally. As always here, you're getting into this gray zone where you get a unique answer for when the answer has all the right properties. But of course, there were some assumptions that went into this, like the fact that there are only these nine letters that can show up. That is an assumption. No one can prove for you that uh, at 25 loops, there's not all of a sudden the 10th letter. This you cannot prove. So there's always some, um, some assumptions there. So, For n for six particles, this was used to seven loops, and I guess from that you can see if you had enough computing power, you could probably go on. Here the same up to four loops, and again, if you had enough computing power, probably go, you could go on. Now, beyond that, there's a phase transition. For n equals eight, things change. And the reason is that the machinery that you used to get these nine letters. So here, the key point is that you start off from nine letters. I didn't tell you how I got them. I said, you observe it in calculations, but then there was an a posteriori mathematical justification, which I didn't give you because that would need more explanation. The same machinery predicts here, I think it's 42. But starting from eight, it predicts infinity. And infinity, not that the answer is infinite, but that it should not be nine possibilities. So you have nine to the power two L terms in the ansatz, but infinity to the power two L terms in the ansatz. So you don't, don't, don't even know where to start because the ansatz, the, the dimension of the space in which you should look is infinite dimension. So this is really now, I mean, there is some understanding of what this means now. And I think this is going down now. It is slowly decreasing the infinity. But this is only, there we are really at the level of like research of the last year. The other question is that if you now go on, so if you solve this problem, you can go on and you come to n equals 10. And here we know by explicit calculation that even the assumption that it's only polylox breaks down. Here actually this between for eight and nine, most likely polylox are enough. But even there, there's, there's at least the question mark. For n equals 10, we know not even polylox will be enough. So, the upshot is that there are special quantum field theories where you can really learn a lot about the lytic structure of quantum field theory, so to very high loop order. But also there you find new things. So whenever you, you make a big progress, so here it was the idea that you understand the functions, you understand the algebraic structure, you, you have the symbols that allow you to encode unitarity and you use that as tools for quantum field theory. You also hit again a wall, but it also tells you where you should look. So this is, this is probably the way forward to understand what is happening, for example, for eight particles and for 10 particles to see what the next step should be. So where should these mathematical technologies be developed further? But that is something that's really there we're at the frontier of uh, current research. So there, I can't say much. But in any case, I think this is all I wanted to say. So thank you very much for your attention and for staying with me for the whole week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Claude. And of course, we still have some time. So uh, if you want to ask questions about the lecture, feel free to do so. Um, can, I, can I ask one question about the letters? Uh... I'm trying to understand what the letters look like. I mean, would this be like X, one plus X, one minus X, stuff like that? Uh, so in the case of the master's box, it was X and one plus X. That was the letters. 
Here, I didn't show them because they're a bit more complicated. So but let me give you an example. So I said that the A1 for six points, there are only three choices. So what are those? Those are, um, they're called U1, U2, U3 usually. And what are they? Uh, remember this theory is conformal and everything you like. So there, those are three conformal cross-stations. Those are st something like this, one, three squared, one, sorry. KL squared over I K squared, JL squared. And then if you go through it, there are three different of these things you can write down. Now, why do, do those show up in the first entry? Um, that you can understand from there. So first of all, they are cost ratios because those are the combinations of invariants that are conformal invariants. The function should be conformal invariant. Now, why these three? Well, remember that in the symbol, what the A1 means, it's actually log A1. That's what it means. So those that would mean that in the end, what you get is the letters would look like this. Right? The, let the letters would be the cost ratios, but since they are logs, they can also interpret them as like this. Now, what are are these the are these axes, are these the dual conformal axes? Yeah. So um, okay. yeah, sorry, maybe I should. It's once you get used to the language too much. Yeah, so the pi, the momenta, with xi plus one minus xi. So that when I write xij, this is actually squared. This is actually xi minus xi plus one minus xj squared, which is pi plus pj plus da da da, da squared. So plus i plus one and so on squared. Okay, there must be some invariants. Now, this means that these things here are logs of Mandelstam invariants. Now, what does this tell you? This tells you that the branch points of the amplitudes should only come from, well, the branch cuts should be from points where the Mandelstam invariant is zero to minus infinity, which is indeed what for massless gauge theory it is. And you can check that there's no other thing it could be. So by conformal invariance, it can only be these three choices. And it cannot be some like for mm -hmm. the second slot, A2, could be any of these or one minus one of them. Now, mm -hmm. these cannot show up in the first slot because mm -hmm. that would mean that you have a branch point in your gauge theory amplitude where. It's not a Mandelstam invariant that vanishes, some the, but, but one minus this thing equals zero, uh, equals one, which has no special meaning. That's not the threshold. The thresholds are at zero. The thresholds are at zero because it's massless particles. So there's all the thresholds are at the origin. If you go to A3, so this tells you now, this gives you six of the nine things. If you go to A3, Things get more complicated. There, these things will be algebraic. They, they would be things like this. Square root of delta divided by two. And then delta would be something like one minus u1 minus u2 minus u3 squared minus four u1 u2 u3. And then you see you can put the minus sign in three different slots. This gives me then three different possibilities. But there you see starting from the third slot, you get things that are more complicated. And those are, to come back to your question that you asked uh, in the first hour, those gives you the square roots, which are now really associated to these branch points that would be like anomaly thresholds, which show up on other Riemann sheets. And, and the U1, U2, U3 are just three different cross ratios? Both of us, these three different cross ratios. So you would need to do this example for n equals, this was n equals six that I discussed. You can give all the, well, there are six different axes. They are turned out to be three different cross ratios. Now you may think, say, why only three if I have six points? It has to do with the fact that you see all the P's are masters. So usually you would think that you can form more cross ratios than three, but the fact that you're in a master theory, 
put the additional constraints in the only three distinct cost ratios you can write down for six particles. Okay. More questions? Maybe I have a question. I mean, this. Um, I mean, this is a little similar when you have. Um, um, I mean, your basis becomes finite for a while, right? That's what you're saying. It grows. Yeah. So the basis loop order and it grows probably polynomial, or. Uh, well, actually, what what's happening here is that this maybe technical. Have you ever heard of what a cluster algebra is? Yes. So actually, yes. this is a three. Uh -huh. These are the cluster variables for A3. This is um, E7. Now, what happens, so the letters are elements of the cluster algebra. That is the deep conjecture. It turns out that they are the cluster algebras for G4, N, for N particles, which GN4 is finite, GN7 is finite, regenerated, starting from uh, eight particles, G4, uh, eight is no longer finite. The cluster algebra itself becomes infinite. That's why it doesn't go polynomial anymore, but you go to eight particles, there's a phase transition and the alphabet becomes, the letters, number of letters becomes infinite. And you understand why this phase transition is? I mean, why, what is, so to say, the physical reason that this becomes so different? Ah, but that, that, that is actually part of what I, was, what I was trying to say here. So people are looking at this. So here, what underlies this is to say, well, you have this uh, connection between anthropomorphic super and Grassmannian spaces. You may have heard of that. And the singularities, but well, the coordinate ring of your Grassmannian space is described by this cluster algebra. And the, the, the Grassmannian space is attached to um, your amplitude to its n particles is 3, 4, comma n. Its coordinate ring is a cluster algebra. So the singularities of my function should be encoded in this coordinate ring, so into this cluster algebra. And there's a theorem that tells you if you have a cluster algebra that it is finite, even only if via sequence of mutations, you can bring it to a Dinkin diagram. Mm -hmm. It turns out that just mathematically, G4, 6, you can bring it to the Dinkin diagram A4. For G4, 7, you can bring it to the Dinkin diagram E7. So you're finite. For 8, you can't. You can prove you can't. So the cluster, alt, the cluster algebra is infinite. But people are looking at now is, well, there should be some kind of, say, possibly a subspace in my cluster algebra that knows enough about physics because at every loop order, I only need a finite number of information. So are there maybe- Actually, that's saying you, you, you have a principle or a symmetry principle that you have not uh, discovered, which could cut you down the yeah. space. Yeah. yeah. So there, there must be more than just saying it is the coordinate ring of my Grassmannian. There must be more information that we're still missing. And that would cut down the infinity from a particle to something finer. I mean, it's finally, it's very, very similar, like, like in topological string theory. So at every loop order, you have a weight. And then at every loop order, you can, I mean, this is a finitely generated ring. And so you can write down a bunch of uh, generators. And then you have to fix the coefficients from the boundary conditions. So it's very similar. But in the case of the topological string, for some reason, the symmetry is strong enough that it works to all genera. So we have understood the symmetry, and then it works to all genera. Well, here it's likely that maybe of course, this is much more complicated. This problem. Yeah, yeah but also here uh, it may just be we don't have enough symmetries yet. So people are looking at this problem n equals eight, and there's something called a topical Grassmannian. And that gives then additional constraints, which bring you to something finite. So that uh, would be the hope. <laughs> that, that would be the hope, <laughs> yeah. But that's what people are looking at now, right now for n equals eight. And uh, I think even last week, there was another paper where people looked at what kind of symbol letters show up for n equals eight. It's actually connected to the following. Um, for n equals six and n equals seven, but 
the coordinate ring of your Grassmannian, since it is a cluster algebra, is actually generated by rational functions. It turns out that for n equals eight, there are letters which are intrinsically no longer rational functions, the algebraic functions. So they cannot come from something that is generated by rational functions. But this tropical Grassmannian idea is now is roughly speaking, if you say, let's take a fan in there or a slice. And this additional constraint is the algebraic constraint that I need to get algebraic uh, singular loci. And I it can no longer get it just from rational functions. That, that's what people are trying to do. How far this what, be what you said, this criterion that leads to this infinity. So at n equal 10, you don't know even what you would, I mean, you don't, so what, what, uh, you need new basis elements, basically. Well, well yeah, I think those two questions are a bit factorized. You got the cluster algebra and the class manager should describe you the singularities. Mm -hmm. Now, then there is, if all of, if you're in a situation where all the singular loci are kind of described by rational function, which is clearly the case here, then you can show that this brings you to polylogs. Now, if you're in a situation where you need more complicated, well, algebraic equation to describe the singular law side, the sky is the limit, right? What right. Kind of, uh, you get some period integrals of integrands with the algebraic functions. And uh, you- Which you have no control over. Exactly, exactly. At this point, at least we have no control over them. So. The question is it is, is it polylogs is even further down. So clearly for n equals 10, we know that polylogs will not be enough. That is this famous strange fact. But even here, in principle, you don't know because uh, we know that the letters that we get are not describable in terms of rational functions only. So you may end up with something where you have additional square roots and that may bring you to something else even here. But this is not known. So for eight and nine, we don't know. The hope is still that this polylogs will be done. Thank you. Okay, good. There are no more questions then. Well, let me. Thank you again for attending the lecture and also to the Beat Center for inviting me to, to give the lecture. And then I wish you a nice weekend. Hey, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.